Hi there, everyone. Thanks for joining our talk on the ethanol industry. I'm Andy Patel, the National Sales Executive for Wells Fargo's Agribusiness, Food and Hospitality Group. I sit in Chicago and lead our group's go-to-market strategy. Prior to banking, I was a grain merchandiser with Archer Daniels Midlands Corn Processing Group, where my primary responsibility was working with local grain elevators in Iowa and Northern Illinois to originate corn for ADM's ethanol production. So ethanol is a conversation that's important to me. Dr. Swanson, to you. Well, thank you, Andy. You know, I'm Michael Swanson, speaking to you from Minnesota. I'm Wells Fargo's ag economist. Prior to that, I was with Land O'Lakes, a large national dairy cooperative that also sells crop inputs. Before that, down in South America with Cargill as a grain trader and also worked with the Burlington Northern Santa Fe hauling grain back many, many years ago. So it's a real pleasure to be talking about this topic, Andy. Thanks. Well, let's go ahead and get started. So I remember when I was a grain merchandiser at ADM's corn processing plan back in 2000, um, the industry just felt different to me, right? I mean, I think ethanol was certainly around, but it, to me, it didn't feel as important as it does now. Am I right? Is ethanol more important in agriculture? And if so, why? You know, you're exactly right. Let's think a little historically here. Back in the early 2000s, ethanol was more of a niche product. It was there, but it wasn't a big part of our fuel. It wasn't mandated at that point. But let's remember something that's very different today than it was in the early 2000s. We were always talking about energy independence back then and how we could achieve it. The United States was in a very different spot. Our crude oil production was declining all the time and our fuel demand was rising all the time. And we were up to a point where we were importing 9 million barrels a day. So the idea of bringing in a million barrels a day of ethanol as a bio-renewable fuel was really exciting. And that really made a big difference. So you're right, we went from it being a niche product to being a huge part of our agricultural system. Yeah, that's great. So there's a question that has been plaguing me for a little bit. So I've been thinking about this for years. At the time, Cedar Rapids was the second large corn processing facility in the world. You know, ADM went and added a dry mill to increase ethanol production. So I've always been wondering why, you know, what's so special about ethanol and what's the rationale to use it? Well, you know, we, we mentioned a few things, you know, when we talked about the history of ethanol. Biorenewable, it's a resource that we produce locally, and that's very important. Secondly, you know, it's kind of the original solar system. I mean, corn is a solar-driven crop, and so it's one of those things that takes advantage of the natural resources we have in the Midwest. You know, Iowa, Illinois, that area you're talking about, grows great corn, some of the best corn yields in the world. And when you think about it, it's also a good product because it has a high oxygenate. If you're using gasoline, you want a higher oxygenate content so it burns cleanly. So between the fact it's bio-renewable, we're good at growing it, and it helps air quality, there's a lot of things in its favor. So it's a great product. Question was, what's its future as we go as we look at the future? Yeah, I know it's great. I mean, ethanol is obviously very important to agriculture, U.S. agriculture, but also to farmers across the country. You know, like my in-laws, who we have, they have two family farms in Nebraska. I know it's definitely helped them with corn uh, demand for corn. You're all across Nebraska, but also across the country as well. But speaking of demand, you know, I know since when I was in the ethanol industry, you know, ethanol plants have increased kind of over that time. So I'm assuming that had an effect on demand. So how much U.S. corn now goes into ethanol? You know, at this moment, about a third, you know, just to use a number that makes sense. I mean, you can argue decimal points. So right now, we're, you know, we're producing let's just say 900,000 barrels of ethanol a day. That's down a little bit because of COVID. You know, we're not driving to work as often in a lot of cases. So about one third of corn is going into ethanol. And you think about it, we're gonna plant approximately 90, 92 million acres of corn this year, depending on weather conditions. So 30 million acres of corn are being dedicated to ethanol. And that's a lot of ground. Yeah, 30 million acres is definitely a lot of ground. So can you help our listeners understand some of the ratios you know, gallons of ethanol per bushel, bushels per acre, kind of inputs, anything around those lines? Absolutely. You know, it, it's important when we have a policy discussion to know the numbers. I mean, so when we think about it, we use a lot of archaic units in agriculture. For example, bushels. A bushel is 56 pounds of corn on a standard test weight. You know, and knowing what a standard test weight is is kind of an archaic issue as well. So 56 pounds of corn will give you 2.8 gallons of ethanol, standard ratio. And you can debate that a little higher, a little bit lower. Along with that though, you get back what they call distiller's grain. Distiller's grain is what's left over after the brewing process. 
And it's a great animal feed, so it has a great home here in the U.S. for feeding and around the world. And you also get some corn oil, about a pound out of that whole mixture. You can use that for biodiesel. So that's that first ratio. And then the other important thing that's changing with time is corn yields. When we started the ethanol policy back in the early 2000s, national corn yields were 130 bushels per acre. Well, today they're at 180. So that's a significant improvement. And what that means is we're seeing a better efficiency in terms of resources in and ethanol out. And getting 180 bushels an acre versus 130 makes ethanol a much better proposition environmentally as well as economically. So those are important numbers to keep in mind all the time. Yeah, no, thank you. You, you know, you mentioned ethanol is one of the original renewable energies, which is great. And, you know, but recently the term, term green energy has been widely popular, right? I mean, we can't hear anything without hearing about electric vehicles, solar, and we definitely can't drive through Iowa or Illinois without running into a wind farm. So kind of given all these changes, what do you feel is the future of ethanol? You know, I'll be blunt, you know, ethanol is up against technologies that can outperform it long term. You know, I use a little bumper sticker with the farmers that says your biggest enemy is Tesla because a Tesla vehicle simply doesn't use gasoline or ethanol. And when you think about battery technology, solar technology, wind technology, they all have longer um, runways ahead of them in terms of improvement. We've seen remarkable improvement in battery costs. For example, you go back 10 years ago to today, there's been a 90% reduction in the price of battery packs. That's something that the Bloomberg annual survey puts out there. And so when you think about all the announcements today, new chemistries, new manufacturing processes for batteries, they certainly are gonna get much better and much cheaper over the next 10 or 15 years. And solar and wind are getting better all the time as well. So even though corn yields are improving, they're not improving as fast as some of that technology. So it's a technological race. And I think that ethanol simply doesn't have as much runway ahead of it as some of the battery technology. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I feel like ethanol was kind of a disruptor back in the 2000s when I was in the ethanol industry. And now there's a new breed of disruptors, right? I mean, can ethanol be displaced? And, and if so, what's that timing look like? You know, ethanol can be displaced. You know, because think about it this way, people don't consume gasoline and ethanol, they consume transportation services. The real question is, how do I get down the road cheaply, safely, you know, and easily? And so if battery powered vehicles do that better than gasoline powered vehicles, it's not about the technology that powers the vehicle. So let's think about that. Just some other numbers to keep in mind. Let's say there's about 270 million vehicles in the U.S. fleet today, and they're almost exclusively gasoline. Well we see about 17 million vehicles sold per year. That's kind of a running average. We see more or less depending on the year. And the average vehicle has about a 14 year service life. So if you imagine this as a big bathtub, what's gonna happen is we're gonna start pouring in more and more electric powered vehicles into this uh, existing stock uh, of vehicles. And on the bottom, we're gonna drain out the older vehicles that are less fuel efficient, that have worn out but it's gonna take a long time to turn over the US fleet. So depending how fast we see the adoption of electric vehicles, it's gonna be at least decades before we eliminate gasoline powered vehicles. And in the interim, it's gonna be a real battle and a real struggle to figure out how fast it's gonna happen. So the numbers matter and it takes a while for these things to happen, but once they start happening, everybody's gonna see the writing on the wall. Great. Thanks, Dr. Swanson. This has been very informative and I appreciate your time and also to our listeners' times. Thank you very much.